from the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, the votes are in. The Twitter votes, that is. Elon Musk's followers have voted that the Tesla CEO should sell 10% of his stake in the company, worth about $21 billion. Will he do it? We'll discuss. Plus, another company heads to the metaverse, AMD, rallying after landing Meta as a new customer. We'll talk to AMD CEO Lisa Su about teaming up with the company formerly known as Facebook. And crypto's new milestone, the market for digital assets, has already quadrupled from 2020. But will that momentum continue? We'll discuss later this hour. All of that in a moment. But first, let's get a look at the markets. And U.S. stocks edging higher with the S&P, notching its longest winning streak since 2017. Bloomberg Kriti Gupta has the full report. Kriti, tell us about the day. Well, Emily, a little bit of a mediocre day when we're talking about the indexes. The S&P 500 closing a little bit higher, but just barely. We can almost call that flat. The Nasdaq 100, however, in the red by, like I said, a, just a little bit marginal move. And you see the New York Bank Index, really that big tech bid unchanged. So a lot of this is going to be positioning, of course, for the CPI report on Wednesday. But a lot of this is also simply the fact that big tech today was split. You had Tesla, Apple, Amazon in the red. You had Microsoft and some of the others in the green. And of course, when that happens, you do tend to see the market play a little bit of a tug of war. What didn't play tug of war, Emily, was cryptocurrencies up 7.8 percent. And that's really where you saw the bid, especially in the stock market. A lot of the marathon digitals, the micro strategies all outperforming today. But let me show you uh, a big chart about the about big tech in particular, because the $2 trillion club made some news today. Alphabet almost closing there, hitting $2 trillion of market cap intraday, and then closing at $1.98 trillion, almost nearing the likes of Apple and Microsoft in that benchmark. Something to watch in the days ahead. Maybe Alphabet will close above that mark. Let's just take a look at some of the other tech subsectors, though, because it, though you talk a little bit kind of a flat, mediocre day from the indexes, the sub-indexes, semiconductors, and the Golden Dragon Index, which really houses those Chinese ADRs, very tech heavy. Those actually outperformed today, Emily. But let's just get to the breaking news here. Lots of earnings stories after the bell. For that, we go to Ed Ludlow. Yeah, and straight to Robinhood, down around 3% in after hours trading. It's disclosed a security breach on November 3rd. 5 million customer emails access, 2 million customer full names access. Crucially, though, no access to social security numbers, credit card numbers, or account numbers. But clearly, that a worrying side for Robinhood, a stock that was up in regular trading on Monday. Emily, your eyes do not deceive you. That does literally say 30% on the screen. Roblox up and surging in after hours after reporting bookings, its term for sales in the quarter, up 28% year on year. Basically some staying power for the online video games market as we come out of the global pandemic. Really positive for Roblox. You were talking about AMD in the intro. Really big move in that stock on Monday. Up 10%. Its biggest gain since July of last year to a fresh record high. As you said, they've won that deal for the server chip to provide that to Meta, the company formerly known as Facebook, making their own little foray into the metaverse. And finally, I want to touch on Tesla. If you bring up that stock on Monday, Tesla down 4.8%, biggest drop since June. At one point, it was down more than 7%, which was its biggest drop since February. Why? I'm not going to tell you why. You've got someone much better to talk to that about, Emily. Back to you. All right. Kriti Gupta, Ed Ludlow, thank you both. Where? We've got someone right here to tell us why. Musk, of course, as Ed said, back with the tweets. Tesla CEO and largest shareholder tweeting out a poll over the weekend asking his Twitter followers whether or not he should sell 10% of his stake. They voted yes. What does that mean? Let's dive into it with Bloomberg's own Dana Hall. So why did he do this? I think, frankly, that Musk is very sensitive to the fact that he's now the richest person on the planet and he's the target of people who want tech billionaires to be taxed. And so he, he, he wants to be seen as being is doing good for the world. And he's been mulling a sale of stock for quite some time. He talked about this in the fall. So is this something he had already planned to do? I think he's been planning it. I mean, he so he has stock options that are expiring and he's going to have to pay taxes on that. But now he's also talking about selling a 10 percent stake. So maybe he sells the shares and buys them back. Maybe they're at an all-time high. Why not take some money off the table and fund his foundation? I mean, he's probably thinking about his legacy and his philanthropy and, 
you know, I think he's been thinking about this for a while. What does this actually mean for the, the tax debate? I mean, is he, is he, is this, is there some amount of benevolence here or is this <laughs> something that he would have to do anyway? I mean, I, th I think it depends in part on the reconciliation bill. The last I checked, taxing billionaires was not part of the package that has yes yet to be passed by Congress. But I imagine that he wants to do whatever he's going to do with his stock sale before, you know, to get the lowest tax rate possible. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think ultimately, I mean, he will pay taxes on this sale and that could be good for taxpayers. But, you know, maybe he's dodging a bigger tax bill down the road. And what does it mean for Tesla and Tesla shareholders, right? Because the more he owns, right, the more shareholders might believe he's invested in the company. Yeah, I mean, I think you, you saw some split among his his fan base because he had always said, my money is the, was the first in and will be the last out. So the idea of him selling is kind of causing consternation among some of the devout. Others are like, oh, you know, he deserves it. He's, you know, built this company up to be such a big thing. He should have money. And he's not really catch rich. All of his wealth is in the stock. But he's certainly not poor either. Um, you know, how does this sort of, we're seeing a more, uh, it seems to be efforts on his part to at least appear more generous with the world hunger, the offer to, you know, provide billions of dollars to help solve world hunger if the UN could prove it. Is there any development on that? So I think what's interesting about Musk is that he's the wealthiest person in the world, but he's always said that his money is going to go to fund SpaceX's Mars mission. He has a foundation, but the foundation makes very small grants to things like his brother Kimball's company. Mm -hmm. So he's not really known for philanthropy, even though he has notions of being involved. I mean, he also pledged $50 million, I believe, to the St. Jude's Hospital. Yeah, he's talking to the world to, about world hunger, carbon capture, but like... He hasn't actually spent a lot of this money yet. Right, and he certainly hasn't committed yet. And just because Twitter said yes doesn't mean he's going to do it, correct? Correct. And there's been no Form 4. So, like, this is all theoretical. I mean, yes, the, Twitter, the Twitterverse has spoken, but, like, until there's a filing, I won't believe it. All right, Bloomberg's Dana Hall. I'm sure you'll be watching your notifications. Thank you. Meantime, McAfee has agreed to be acquired by an investor group co-led by Advent International and Premiera, an all-cash transaction with an equity value of $12 billion. That takes the global online protection provider private. We'll have much more on that later this hour. And coming up, AMD racks up a big win with Meta, the company formerly known as Facebook, now an AMD customer. CEO Lisa Su joins us right here next. We'll talk about what it means, just what she thinks of the metaverse and her outlook on the chip crisis. This is Bloomberg. Shares of advanced micro devices ending up more than 10% after the company announced it won Meta, formerly known as Facebook, as a chip customer. AMD also revealing a range of new chips to take on rivals like NVIDIA and Intel. All of this on the heels of third quarter earnings that were very, very strong. Joining me now to talk about it all and much more, AMD CEO and President Lisa Su. Lisa, great to have you back with us. So just how big a win is landing Facebook, or I should say Meta, as a customer for AMD. Hey, Emily, it's great to be here with you. And I would say it was a big day for AMD. Uh, we had, uh, we, you know, we really talked about a range of things today in our data center. So we talked about, um, you know, new products in terms of our new CPU products and our new GPU, uh, GPU products, as well as the fact that now 10 of the largest hyperscalers, including Meta, um, are using AMD Epic. So we're extremely excited about it. Um, I think it's really, uh, just goes to say a little bit about, you know, sort of our long-term focus on the data center and really wanting to make sure um, that we are working and partnering with the most important companies in the world. This now means, as you say, you are working with so many of these hyperscalers, including not just Meta, but Microsoft and Amazon and Google. Talk to us, give us some more color on, on what it's taken to win over these big customers and cut into market share of your competitors. Yeah, so uh, this has been, um, you know, our focus over the last uh, four or five years has been really to, you know, build up the capabilities in the data center. You know, we see the data center as one of the most exciting, if not the most exciting market um, in uh, semiconductors. You know, there's this um, massive need for high performance computing and each one of these, um, you know, large um, hyperscalers are doing such, you know, unique and innovative things. So, um, you know, we're honored, uh, frankly, to be partnered with, um, with all of them 
them. Um, I think it says a lot about the technology that you need and sort of the multi-generational roadmap that you need. And uh, you know, being able to partner with the best means that you learn how to make your roadmap even stronger you know, going forward. Now, I do want to talk a little bit about Meta and its bet on the metaverse. A lot of people still don't know what the metaverse is. Just how big an opportunity do you think the metaverse will be? And do you see, what do you see as AMD's role in it? Yeah, so look, we're excited. If I just take a step back, Emily, and talk about sort of high performance computing and you know what you know we believe and what I believe is that there's really this mega cycle around needing more computing in so many different applications. You know, whether you're talking about collaboration applications or you're talking about you know research applications or you're talking about you know just you know analyzing massive amounts of data and yes the metaverse is even the next thing you know on top of it so uh, we believe it's a very large opportunity if you look at you know high performance computing in its entirety um, I think the metaverse is um, you know one of those areas that uh, that many people are talking about in terms of you know how do you really bring together you know virtual reality and mixed reality together with all of the collaboration that we're doing now. I think we have new expectations of what life is like uh, post pandemic. So it's an exciting vision. And, um, you know, we view it as uh, really an opportunity where you need high performance, you know, CPUs or microprocessors and high performance graphics and, and GPUs and, and artificial intelligence and machine learning and visualization and really bringing all of that together. And, you know, we're unique in the sense that, you know, we really do look at sort of the end to end use cases and really work with our partners on, um, on making that happen. So, you know, we view, view just tremendous opportunity in uh, high performance computing going forward. You do have new GPU and CPU offerings, and I'm curious why we're seeing you now broaden out some of your offerings when it's that focus and execution that has served AMZ so well. Well, you know, we're excited about the data center overall, Emily. And when um, you really look at all of the um, expansion, it's really um, an area of secular growth. And as the markets get larger, you see more and more specialization. So no question, um, our Epic product family and our general purpose um, you know, data center um, you know, server processors have done extremely well. And you know, we're going to continue to be very, very aggressive on that roadmap. Um, but the fact is there are these large use cases around um, you know, high performance computing and AI, and those need GPUs, and we can put them you know, together in a very efficient um, way in a system. Um, we also announced today that we're broadening our offerings to include a, a cloud-focused um, you know, processor line versus let's call it a more general purpose line. And, and again, um, this is just this expansion of computing really allowing and enabling us to, uh, you know, to one, invest more, and two, really try to tailor and partner with what we think uh, our customers and partners are going to need going forward. How do you see Genoa, your next design for data center chips, actually shaking up the competitive landscape, cutting into market share um, for folks like Intel and users of ARM technology that are also trying to break in? Well, I think the um, you know the key in this market, frankly, is um, execution. You know, strong execution, generation after generation. Um, you know, our current generation Milan processors are fantastic. I mean, we're very, very um, excited about the adoption. You know, we just announced our third quarter earnings, and we doubled um, our you know server processors as well as our data center processor sales, um, you know, year on year. And that just kind of tells you a little bit about sort of the momentum we have. Genoa is the fourth generation. Genoa is um, very, very strong. It, it really builds on top of, um, you know, the capabilities that we have with, uh, with Milan. We add a whole bunch of new IO features. Um, we expand the number of cores and the amount of performance. And what that should mean to our customers is they can do more um, in the same footprint, you know, data center, folks are all about total cost of ownership and how much can they do in a, in a given footprint. And so um, the fact that you know, Genoa is, is an, another big step forward, we're going to use five nanometer technology. Um, it has a lot of new architectural features. Um, we're excited about Genoa. Now with all of these new products, you seem to be planning for a much bigger AMD. Can you get the supply to match these ambitions and help you carry them out? Yeah, so um, no question, uh, we are planning for a bigger AMD. Um, uh, the, uh, the thought, um, you know, if we look at our trajectory, um, the last two years have been tremendous growth. You know, we've just guided 2021 um, to 65% year on year growth. You know, when we started the year, uh, sort of in January, we thought it was 37%. So we've been able to add 
um, a lot of supply, as well as there's just very strong demand uh, for AMD processors right now. Uh, we are working um, very, um, very closely with all of our supply chain partners. There's an incredible amount of work going to uh, ramp up overall supply chain capacity. And we're, we feel very good about the trajectory of what we see going into uh, 2022 and beyond. And these are all long-term partnerships, Emily. So it's really about, you know, how do we plan with our customers and our supply chain partners, not just for this quarter or next quarter, but for, you know, 2022, 2023 and beyond um, to make sure that we can meet all of this incredible demand that's out there. Still, the chip shortage and supply issues seem to be a continuing crisis for everyone else. And I'm curious how long you think we're going to see the ripple effects of this. Is this something that you think will continue to reverberate across industries for years, potentially? Yeah, you know, I get asked that question a lot. I think you've asked that question to me a few times. Um, I will tell you that um, I think the um, the environment is such that there's um, a lot of capacity and a lot of investment that's being put online. Um, so that's positive. Um, you know, like I said, we saw more uh, you know more uh, growth and more capability in uh, towards the end of 2021 than earlier in the year. Um, I think the first half of 22 is still going to be pretty tight. Um, but we're going to see improvements as we go into the second half of 22. And I feel confident that the semiconductor industry, you know, is going to respond to the challenge. And every quarter it'll get, um, you know, incrementally better going forward. It's hard not to keep asking because the situation, you know, seems to be continuing and, and keeps changing. So I do appreciate you giving us an update um, every time you come on the show. You know, you did have a, a, a strong qu quarter great third quarter. As you look into 2022, what's really going to be, what are going to be the defining trends, the defining trends that will drive AMD's growth through the next year? Yeah, sure, Emily. So um, I think as we look forward, uh, you know, the most important thing is we are in um, the right markets. I mean, it's a very exciting world um, in uh, this high performance computing world. You know, if we looked at the TAM of, or the total market size uh, just, you know, maybe 18 months ago, we might have sized it at about 80 billion or so, we now see that market size or that market opportunity um, upwards of 100 billion. So there's a lot of need um, for um, you know, computing and, and computing capability. And from an AMD standpoint, um, I think our product portfolio is the best it's ever been. Um, and it's, it's only going to get better. I think we're excited. We have a whole slew of products that we're launching in 2022. And you know, we'll talk more about that over the coming months. And you know, our goal is to continue to partner with the best um, the best uh, brands in the um, in the industry and make sure that we're providing them you know the best solutions. So um, I think it's a great growth environment for us. We're going to continue to work hard at at uh, satisfying you know all the demand out there. But I think we're very optimistic about uh, about 2022. Well, it'll be interesting to see just how much the metaverse proper is part of that growth. I'm curious if you have an idea of when you think we will see this new universe, if you will really come alive, especially for the mainstream? Yeah, I think people are doing, you know, um, a lot of experimentation um, in the area, Emily. And, and you know, as I said, uh, you know, there are announcements from a number of companies out there. And we'll see things, you know, come uh, come together incrementally over the next few years. But I like to think of the metaverse, it's not going to be like one big bang that you're going to see everything come out. You're going to see, um, you know, really, uh, products building on each other and capabilities building on each other. And, um, you know, the fundamental um, underneath that is you need, you know, great um, high performance processing technology, which is which is what we're working on. All right. AMD CEO, Lisa Su, always good to have you here. Thanks so much for sharing those new products and that view of the future with us. OK, coming up, Tencent making moves to circumvent China's crackdown on video games. We'll tell you how next. And as we head to break, let's take a look at PayPal, the company lowering its full year guidance for revenue and earnings after its former parent company, eBay, accelerated a shift away from the payments giant. Meantime, PayPal has inked a deal with Amazon to allow Venmo wallets to be accepted on the e-commerce site. This is Bloomberg.
few stories we're following. SoftBank CEO Masayoshi Son says the company will buy back as much as $8.8 billion or 1 trillion yen, $8.8 billion or 1 trillion yen of its stock when it comes out to about 14.6%. This after a decline in the value of its portfolio companies led to a record loss in its vision fund investment unit. The company's shares have slid more than 40% from their peak in mid-March. Tencent pulled off a pair of successes with its League of Legends franchise. Not only did it hold a massive esports tournament that drew more viewers than ever before, but it also premiered Arcane on Netflix, garnering 130 million views in China just a few hours. Tencent is trying to cope with China's crackdown on the video games industry after saying kids could only play about three hours a week, which caused stock prices to drop for Tencent and others across the gaming world. And Toshiba is considering splitting up the company as it looks for ways to strengthen shareholder value. The Japanese conglomerate is reportedly going to divide itself into three companies to focus on infrastructure, devices, and semiconductor memory as early as 2023. Toshiba has been in turmoil with its shareholders over the best direction for the company and whether it should pursue going private. Coming up. First Facebook, then Microsoft, making big bets on the metaverse. We're going to be with the Pillion Co. managing partner, former head of Amazon Studios, Matthew Ball, his vision for just how big the metaverse will be and who will own it. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Let's head over to the markets where our Ed Ludlow has news of that McAfee deal and what yeah. it means. Ed, take it away. A little blast from the past, but it's like something we rely on each day. You know, antivirus software, security software. I remember in my parents installing McAfee on my desktop when I was a kid. Big deal, a buyout essentially from a consortium of private equity names, valuing the company at $14 billion, including its debt. Let's bring out some of the details of this deal. The consortium includes big names. You have can Canada's pension plan involved, Abu Dhabi's investment authority, Crosspoint. They're going to offer $26 a share, which is a pretty hefty premium on where McAfee closed on Friday before the deal was announced on Monday. They're going to have 45 days to consider it. They can look elsewhere. But this is a like really good history lesson when you look into McAfee. Remember, founded in 1987 by the entrepreneur John McAfee. It was later sold to Intel in 2010. Intel then spun it off to TPG in 2016. And ultimately, the company ends up going public in October 2020, just over a year ago. And you can see how it's performed over the last 12 months or so. Pretty reasonable gains, around 26% full year 2020, 2021. So it's done pretty well. But now we're coming full circle and we take it private again. Just shows the appetite that's still out there for software companies. Emily. All right, Ed, thanks much. Meantime, it's still all about the metaverse, but should it be? The optimists believe how you learn, work, and get entertained will all change dramatically in this new world, all while creating new opportunities for advertisers, investors, and creators. For more, I want to bring in Matthew Ball, managing partner at Apillion Co. and former head of strategy at Amazon Studios, who was talking about the opportunity in the metaverse long before Facebook changed its name. So, Matthew, so much has changed in the last just couple of weeks. You got a new name for Facebook, you know, obviously making this big bet. You've got Microsoft making its big bet on the metaverse. Do you see this as a world where, you know, just one or companies will one or two companies will own it or is it going to be much bigger than that? It's going to be so much larger than that. I mean, we can look at the internet as an example. The digital economy is assumed to be roughly 18 to 20 percent of the world economy at 87 trillion dollars. The truth of the matter is the big five tech companies historically considered GAFAM, though of course Facebook has changed its name, was only 10 percent of that digital economy. It depended on myriad different developers, semiconductor, compute, networking and other infrastructure and optimization companies. The metaverse will be similar. Can Facebook, though, build a competitive platform that younger users want to join and be part of? Can they get beyond 
these reputational issues and trust issues? Can they certainly? We're looking at a company that is spending perhaps more on this area than anyone else on earth, has a founder in control with extraordinary conviction, and 3 billion monthly active users, 2 billion daily active users. It's very difficult to say that they can't solve that sort of problem, but that doesn't mean it's going to be easy. In particular, Facebook has a bad reputation that spans roughly a decade with developers. Ultimately, developers are going to build the metaverse, developers are going to be required to attract users, and that requires a skill set that Facebook historically has not thrived in. Well, now you see Facebook and Microsoft and even Amazon, you know, all of these big tech companies talking about the metaverse. Is this just going to be a place where big tech companies just get bigger? Or are there going to be upstarts and new players that can sort of take on the, 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 you know, the, co the companies that own the Internet right now? Conventional wisdom would suggest that we're going to see some of today's leaders thrive in the next generation internet or the metaverse, but in particular, we'll see new companies come to the forefront. Consensus was that AT&T and AOL would lead in the internet era, that Microsoft's advantages would endure, and in fact, none of that happened. When we take a look at the current state of the metaverse, some of the thriving companies today have sub $50 billion market caps in a year and a half ago, we're sub five, Epic Games, Unity, Roblox, which absolutely blew it out of the park today in earnings. Those companies have a lot of headroom in front of them, and they have many different capabilities that today's tech giants do not. Here's a question that just came in over IB. Are we going to be talking about multiple metaverses in a few years, or is there just one? It's a bit of a taxonomy question. Most people believe that the answer is that the metaverse is the definite article. Just like we don't say there are multiple internets, there's no Facebook internet, Google internet, there is the internet. That seems to be the most likely vision of the future for the metaverse, which like the internet is premised upon interoperability. But to some extent that may just come down to how language is used. If we adopt metaverse as a platform specific definition, then we'll end up with multiple metaverses. It's not really a question of verbiage. Meantime, your Metaverse ETF has been on fire, and I'm sure that some of this news ha has helped. Uh, you know, talk to us about the future of where this is going as a bet for investors. Sure. Well, Jensen Huang, the founder and CEO of NVIDIA, which of course popped more than $150 billion in market cap Friday and Monday, believes that the Metaverse economy will exceed that of the physical world, again, $87 trillion. Even if you have more modest expectations, Precedent from the digital economy, the internet, mobile internet, suggests that this is a 10 to $30 trillion opportunity that will manifest in a decade or a decade and a half. Our belief is that value will be widely distributed across the semis, the computes, the payment companies, virtual platforms, and other infrastructure providers. Our ETF is designed to provide a diversified portfolio of exposure to those opportunities. And we're delighted that investors have been so excited. We announced today that over 250 million in AUM has been amassed since June 30th. And today we saw another three and a half million shares trade, a total of $50 million in value. Enthusiasm for the subject is only continuing to grow. Meantime, I have to ask you about Roblox. I mean, they, they had this 72 hour long outage where their entire you know universe goes offline. Then they report these strong results. What does that tell you? It tells me that this is a true secular and most importantly generational shift. If you go back to 2008, Facebook had 300 million MAUs. Today, Roblox has about 210 million MAUs, 47 million DAUs. That number is up 35 percent year over year against very challenging mid-pandemic comps. And despite that outage, we see significant growth. I believe, as do many others, that we're heading towards a future in which hundreds of millions, if billions of people around the world participate in these virtual worlds. And as a result, it doesn't matter if it's one company, one outage, a quarter in which kids are going more outside than ever or returning to work. This is a trend that is going to stay. Netflix games, some movement on that over the last week as well. How optimistic are you and, and who, who does this threaten? Well, the truth of the matter is Netflix is an incredibly high-performing company that takes a very long time horizon to change. They launched their streaming platform in 2007. They launched their Originals banner in 2009, commissioned their first series in 2011, aired it in 2013, 
And it wasn't until 2017 or 2018 that most of their spend was on originals. It's very clear that Reed Hastings knows how to execute, knows how to build new technical capabilities, and knows how to be judicious in his investments and his expansions. That plus the fact that gaming is an ever-changing category, we're on the cusp of AR, VR, other mixed reality environments, tells me that they have the opportunity to thrive in this category, and they've committed themselves to achieving that over some time horizon. All right. Matthew Ball, Apelian Co. Managing Partner, thanks for giving us a glimpse of the future here. Always appreciate you stopping by. Coming up, the crypto world has hit a $3 trillion market cap as Ethereum and Bitcoin gained further traction just over the weekend. Ether hitting all-time highs just Monday morning. Looking at the rally and how digital currency is playing a role in the larger creator economy. That's next. This is Bloomberg. The crypto market has been on a tear, most recently hitting a $3 trillion market cap. Ether and Bitcoin have both gained, sending the value of the crypto universe quadrupling from its 2020 year-end value. Excitement isn't just around the coins themselves, but of course the overall growth of decentralized finance and NFTs and what this holds for the future of the creator economy. Lee Jin, Variant Fund co-founder and general partner, joins us now. Lee, you recently launched a $110 million new fund for crypto startups. What will you back and how do you make sure you're buying into the reality and not the hype? Yeah, so uh, first of all, we're backing the thesis of the ownership economy. Variant is very much focused on this particular thesis that all next generation internet platforms are going to be built, operated, and owned by their users. And we think that distributing ownership widely among one's user base creates really powerful incentive alignment that is going to allow networks to grow much bigger, faster than they could have under the centralized model of building platforms. And we think that crypto tokens uniquely and powerfully enables that by allowing value and ownership to be distributed much wide, much more widely among a larger base of participants. Um, this already exists in small scale in Silicon Valley in the form of stock option grants to employees. But if we think of all of the large platforms that have been built over the last decade in the creator economy or the gig economy, a lot of users have obviously been left out of that ownership equation. And so our thesis as a firm is really to invest in those next generation platforms that are going to distribute ownership over to their participants and create much larger networks than what were previously possible. So take us three, five, or I don't know, maybe it's 10 years out. How, do, how is this creator economy different than the creator economy today that is owned by, let's say, the Instagrams and TikToks and YouTubes of the world? Yeah, so I think we're at a really interesting moment in the evolution of the creator economy. Um, the creator economy has existed for a really long time, really ever since the birth of user-generated content platforms, there have been creators on the internet. I think what's really new and different right now is that a lot of those creators are seeing themselves as entrepreneurs and small business owners and trying to carve out a space for themselves online and monetize the attention that they have from their audience in different ways by offering different types of products. Um, but today, that really ex is existing on the terms of a few very centralized dominant social media platforms. Creators are not really in control of their content, their data, their end user relationships, how they actually monetize. And so my hope is going forward, um, and I think what is enabled by crypto is a creator economy in which creators are really able to be in control of their own destinies, where they're able to set the terms of how they monetize, um, how they own their content. They're, they're going to be able to hopefully be able to take their data with them and not be beholden to any one centralized platform. And I think that's really exist that's really exciting um, and unlocks so many new possibilities for creators. And furthermore, I think um, in that world, it's not just about the creator economy, it's actually about the community economy where creators can allow their fans to participate in the upside of their careers. And in that world, the lines between who's a creator versus who's a fan starts to blur and everyone is able to share in their success and um, be very aligned towards the success of the community. 
You've been really vocal about the rise of NFTs topping $13 billion in just the first three quarters of this year. How do you expect that to shake out? Like, what does it look like next year? Yeah, in general, we think that NFTs are a really broad new type of digital content, and I think they're going to encompass a lot of different types of assets on the internet. Essentially, everything around us in the physical world is like a non-fungible asset, and I think we're going to see that play out in the digital world as well. Right now, NFTs and all of the transaction volume around them is really around NFTs as digital, digital art and collectibles and people purchasing high-value collectibles. But I think in the future, you'll see a lot more use cases for NFTs, potentially in gaming or as access to special experiences. And so we're really excited to see all of those new use cases play out in the future. What's your take on the recent rally? Does it keep going up? Does it matter? Yeah, so um, it's definitely really exciting to see as just a participant in the ecosystem. But at the end of the day, we are running a long-term venture firm um, and we take a very long view on all of our investments. We're not day traders. We really are investing at the very earliest stages of these companies' existences. And we are really therefore kind of immune to the ups and downs in the market and, and don't pay all that much attention to it. I think the most exciting projects are going to take multiple years or decades to play out. And we really aim to be the long-term partners to those builders. All right, Lee Jin, Variant Fund co-founder and general partner. Thank you so much for joining us, giving us a view of what's ahead. Coming up, it is Merger Monday and we're highlighting one of the most recognizable names in cybersecurity. That's McAfee. Details on the $14 billion acquisition coming up. And Marvel's new squad of superheroes secured the top spot at the U.S. box office this weekend. Eternals taking in $71 million in ticket sales. However, that was less than estimates. The movie is about a diverse team of superheroes that have secretly lived on Earth for thousands of years. It's directed by Academy Award winner Chloe Zhao and stars Selma Hayek and Angelina Jolie. This is Bloomberg. All right, let's take a quick look at some of the details emerging from the AMC earnings call underway right now. AMC is exploring if it's possible to create its own cryptocurrency. Heard that right. AMC also saying it's in conversations about NFTs related to major film titles, though these conversations are very preliminary at this time. Obviously, we were just talking about how big the market for NFTs has become in just the last three quarters. We'll bring you more details as we have them, we're still listening into that. Meantime, welcome next door. The social network that connects neighbors began trading Monday on the New York Stock Exchange under the ticker KIND after merging with the special purpose acquisition company Coastla Ventures acquisition. Shares of Nextdoor surging 40% in the first hour of trading and ending the day higher. Nextdoor CEO Sarah Fryer says her focus is on the long run and not the stock price. Next door equals neighborhood. Uh, we believe we have a global opportunity on our hands. Um, of course, we're doing it for the right reasons. We're all about purpose and about making it a kinder world. But we also know we have a great business on our hands. A lot of data that allows us to do an ad-sponsored model, and we're excited about where the business is going from here. And obviously, a part of this process has been getting a lot of capital into the business, yeah. around about $700 million that you're going to be able to deploy. Talk to us about where you're going to spend that and what is going to be the sort of first order of business there. Yeah, so obviously, it was a fundraising opportunity because we wanted to bolster the balance sheet. Uh, where we're going with that investment, number one is to continue to build out for growth and engagement. More neighbors coming to the platform and as they come to the platform how do we engage them more that involves uh, ongoing investment in areas like data science machine learning of course when you have a lot of data you want to make sure that neighbors are getting the best possible experience second is our ad platform and of course what we're building for small local businesses so that is a big area of investment and then finally international today we're in 11 countries 280,000 neighborhoods but we know we can go global one thing that's obviously happening right now in the sort of social media space generally is this move towards social commerce, 
slightly uh, self-brag here, but obviously we broke this PayPal okay. Pinterest story a few weeks ago. I wonder how a company like Nextdoor looks to play into that and, and whether it sees itself as a sort of an acquirer or a potential target for someone else. So on the social commerce front, I mean, we have a really high intent audience. When people come, they come to get something done, usually locally, and they stick around. And that makes for a great audience when you start thinking about things like social commerce. For us today, it's a lot more about things like services. So people come because they want to find the local plumber, maybe a contractor, maybe it's a babysitter, um, and they tend to convert very fast. So we do well for advertisers, top of the funnel, brand, and then bottom of the funnel, direct response. But over time, we absolutely see a way to embrace even more where social commerce is going. I came from a payment platform, so it's of interest to me. And I think Nextdoor is a really valuable site for all of this. As you say, you, you came from Square. You were the CFO there. Um, and I want to almost take it back to Ed's first question. I, the pop in the stock today, absolutely breathtaking. And I'm wondering kind of how much of a role you're playing in that. Clearly a huge one, but your history is well known to Wall Street. They know and like you, it seems. How big, a, how big an impact do you think that is ha having? And how, is that the kind of the lesson learned here, that if you've got that kind of management team in place, SPACs still work? You know, in the end, it's a fundraising opportunity. So you have to decide as a management team, A, do you need the proceeds? And if you raise them, can you invest them in an ROI positive way? And we absolutely felt that. The way we chose to go public, in the end, we wanted to optimize for what was out there in the market. We find a great partner in Coastal Ventures. Vinod and I had worked together at Square for over seven years, so I trusted him. And I know that Vinod brings a lot of really good long-term strategy alongside being a great recruiter. And now it's about execution. I think what the market loves is the business that we've built to date, but they also understand the opportunity that's ahead of us. And that's what got me excited. Of course, in the end, we don't look at stocks, right? Stocks are just one-day actions. This is all about the long run. In the end, the market will be a weighing machine. It'll trade to fundamentals, and we need to keep making sure we're building a great business to go to keep building those fundamentals. Next door, CEO Sarah Fryer there. Now to a Bloomberg scoop, McAfee going private again. A large investor group looking at a $14 billion deal for the cybersecurity company. For more on this, I'm joined by Bloomberg's Liana Baker, who leads our deals team from New York. So, Liana, why is McAfee thinking about going private now again? So it's sort of the gift that keeps on giving for bankers. This company has now gone public twice and been taken private twice. But what I'm hearing is that since the IPO last year, the company hadn't really been valued for being more than an antivirus player. So maybe in the private markets, it'll kind of get that attention and care it needs and a better valuation. So uh, talk to us about the, the history, because I, I think that certainly adds to the story of why this is significant. What the company would say also is that John McAfee, who you know is a well-known uh, story, uh, isn't involved in the company anymore. But uh, definitely a huge deal-making history here. Intel actually acquired the company in 2010, and since then it had been uh, you know carving out parts of it, bringing in private equity. And the latest iteration was the IPO last year. The IPO price was $20, and the company is now going private for $26. So you kind of get the idea that maybe the public markets wasn't the most welcoming home for McAfee. There's been so much tech deal making this year. It's kind of now part of this trend. Private equity firms are looking for targets, and this kind of fit the bill. It's been a busy year for tech deal making. What else can we expect? Well, there aren't many cybersecurity targets left. Uh, Norton LifeLock is one that's you know, public, and they did a big deal with Avast earlier this year. Um, it, it's, it's been just a, a banner year for tech deals. I'm trying to figure out what could be next, although at $14 billion, you know, this does kind of uh, take up a lot of that financing in the market. There's a really big equity check here, but we're hearing that the market could handle a lot more deals. We could be headed for $5 trillion in global M&A volumes this year. So really, the sky's the limit for deal making, whether it's private equity firms or strategics with deep pockets. All right. Well, we'll be watching for more of your Bloomberg scoops then. Bloomberg's Liana Baker, thank you for stopping by. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Great show coming up tomorrow. We're going to be joined by Blue Apron CEO Linda Finley, as well as Othman Laraki, the CEO of the health tech company Color. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg.